Hello everybody, this is JW Nigerian from Networking Fools and I'm here today uh, with Gary Goldstein, Gary W. Goldstein. Uh, Gary is a Hollywood producer, uh, started out as a lawyer, um, he's worked with business to turn, help turn around business, he's worked in branding, marketing, and well, we're going to get into it all because there's quite a lot of stuff you do. Anyway, Gary's been uh, a good friend of mine for years, and it's funny, I've interviewed all kinds of people, and Gary's always, a, you know, it's always your, your good friend that you, you get the last. Uh, but I've been wanting to do this interview for quite a long time, and I'm very happy to uh, be here with Gary today. Hello, Gary. Thanks so much. So Are you much. kidding, JW? Uh, okay, so a little editorial to start. JW is <laughs> one of the greatest guys on the planet. I adore him. I admire him. Oh, come on. And no, uh, we got we got to <laughs> go there because Networking Fools is really an exciting idea, and I'm absolutely flattered to be a part of it. Oh, well, so glad you could be on. I mean, you know, you've always made yourself available to me at all times. You've always been a gracious and wonderful friend. And um, out of all the interviews I do... Um, you know, yours is the one I've been looking forward to for such a, a long time because Gary's a storyteller, and uh, you know, most of us, uh, you know, we go through our nine to five uh, day, and uh, you know, many things interesting happen to us. But uh, you're one of the few that have been, I mean, can, has has been out there and done some crazy stuff, and has some great stories. And so I wanted to ask you about some of those today and kind of share those with our listeners. I'm delighted. Well, you know, it's me. It really all, life comes down to story. It's really that simple. When I was a kid, I remember the first book that really captured my imagination was The Scarlet Pimpernel, my first superhero, right? Mm -hmm. Ever since I was young, I just loved, it didn't matter whether it was film or book or oral storytelling, I was just captivated by people's stories. And to this day, whether it's filmmaking, uh, even that's what, what, honestly, that's what was behind uh, my wanting to be a criminal defense lawyer. I loved the theater of the courtroom and telling a great, compelling story and trying to persuade the jury and the and the bailiff and the judge and the district attorney and everybody uh, to a certain point of view, a certain story. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with filmmaking in all the entertainment areas. It's the same. Uh, honestly, I find, and when I came a little bit out of Hollywood and I started doing more consulting to businesses, it's the thing that I think most surprised me was the power of a great story and how much business owners, entrepreneurs, corporate officers overlook how indelible, how persuasive, how important their individual story, the story of their company, the story of their team, the story of their customer. Hmm. And so I, I think business is, I didn't know this before, but business is every bit as sexy and creative and, and, and amazing to me as, as filmmaking. It's just faster paced. Okay, let me frame this story up, today's story. Um, we're sitting here with Gary Goldstein, and if you don't know Gary, uh, he was a co-producer of uh, a little-known movie made uh, uh, called Pretty Woman. Years ago, uh, <laughs> yeah. Pretty Woman, you did... Uh, Let's see, Under Siege 1 and 2, and uh, let's see, also Mothman Prophecies. Yeah. And uh, one of my favorites, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the lesser known indie films that even my family hasn't seen, we're going to get to. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we're sitting here, what's the, to frame up the story, we're sitting here in the Hollywood Hills, of all places, in the gorgeous Hollywood. If you could see beyond these trees right here, you'd see a gorgeous view of the, yeah, I don't know, what do you call it, the Hollywood Valley. I don't know the, what you The call city. It. The yeah. city is just yeah. above Sunset Boulevard, so um, we're in one of the, we're in a great, we're in a great area for this interview. Um, but I want to, I want to go back a little bit, uh, because your story is really interesting, but I want to kind of find out where is who's Gary and where did Gary come from uh, well physically I was born in New York but when I was 10 years old I have one older brother my family my father's family was all East Coast my mother's was all generations of San Francisco and we picked up and moved it and I grew up in San Francisco all during the 60s and went to Berkeley as an undergrad I mean, my timing was amazing. I mean, I was mm -hmm. a freshman at Berkeley in '68, the year of People's Park and Eldridge Cleaver and the ending the war and all that. And of course, you just watched it and maybe inhaled. Uh, actually, <laughs> here's what's interesting: a, a, a very dear friend of mine who'd been a neighbor was two years ahead of me. He was the A and R. Uh, at that time, all the big music labels mm -hmm. uh, decided that San Francisco was the next great outpost, and my friend Sid, 
became the A&R guy for the Berkeley campus for Columbia Records. Big label at the time. Mm -hmm. When I, and he wore a second hat, and the second hat was, he was the producer and promoter of all the concerts and cabarets for the campus of UC Berkeley. So he took all the big artists, put them on stage, produ produced them. So when I came over, he knew my love of music. He said, you're going to do it with me. You're going to be, and when I leave, you'll be the A&R guy for Columbia, and you'll be the, the, the sole head of uh, chairman of music, or whatever they called wow, it. Wow, what a good campus. friend. So that's what happened. I became the youngest A&R guy for Columbia in the Bay Area at the time. And I produced the concert. We put on Joni Mitchell, we put on Graham Nash, we put on Steve Miller and, and Chuck Berry, and just on and on and on. We had a ball. All during this political heyday of, you know, uprisings and tear gas and the whole, it was very colorful. Mm -hmm. Altamont, the whole deal. So, I was a hippie. But when I came out of Berkeley, here was the problem. At that time, socially, there were very few acceptable options. You didn't go to work for a major corporation. Right. It was a different day. You became a teacher, you became an academic, you became, you know, a crusader. And my heroes at the time were the, the Tony Serres and the William Kunstlers who defended the Chicago 7 and the, you know, and I thought, wow, I could be a political defense lawyer, a criminal defense lawyer. So that's what I wanted to do. But I was out of college for several years. I was really kind of a lost soul. I was very much a dreamer. Mm -hmm. and not very grounded. I decided that, okay, I'll go to law school, I'll go down that track, I'll become a great criminal defense lawyer, and at least I'll have a law degree so I'll feel like I speak an adult language, I'll have grounding, I'll get some respect. Right, so how, the music thing, which is huge onto itself, I didn't even know that about you. Um, how do you leave that? Um, I was I, I was an idealist. I was disenchanted with the inner workings of the music business. Right. Um, if I hadn't been so naive, I might have stayed with it because I really loved music, mm -hmm. uh, and it might have been a great career. As it turns out, none of the pieces of our puzzles are misused time. Right. They're not accidents. Right. Music is really what I think prepared me to be a film producer. Okay. How to work with top tier talent? How to you know understand the business and the creative mix of things? So it really came in handy. But anyway, it, was, it, it didn't match me at the time. Okay. So I, I bummed around. I had some really silly jobs. I was a bit of a lost soul. I went to law school. Um, I started to mention you earlier. I worked in in a really depressed part of the ghetto in San Francisco. Right. Uh, in lieu of the public defender, we defended the indigent adults, and it was an amazing chapter of my life. I mean, made me really appreciate my life relative to a lot of people on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, why don't you go back on that and tell me the, the story about how you actually got into law school. Well, I was rejected from law school. Yeah. <laughs> and and what, what had happened was um, I, I really had my heart set. This was before I went to law school, and I had my heart set on on being a defender of the underdog. I was very romantic in my view of this. Right. And I talked to people and they told me about this foundation that was publicly funded out in the ghetto, a part of town, the southern part of the city, no one went to unless they really meant to go there. It was a rugged, rough, unfriendly part of town and um, where the projects and everything were. And I made up my mind I was going to go to work there. So I drove out there and uh, it was... Uh, I was a long hair hippie and I was kind of lost and I was intimidated and terrified. And I found the ramshackle redevelopment buildings that housed the social workers and the investigators and the lawyers and the... because they had unemployment, they had job skills training, they had everything. 120 or so people. And I walked into this beehive of activity, I think it was one of maybe three white people out there, mm -hmm. and uh, grabbed hold of someone's coat and said, I want to work here. I didn't know what else to say. And they looked at me like, well, who, who are you? Uh, I was not a lawyer. I, they had no money. What could I do for them? And I just wouldn't go away. And I literally kept showing up, and finally I showed up. They, they said, well, just come to a staff meeting and meet our chief counsel. And I went to the staff meeting, and I sat in the corner quivering. And they said, well, we have no money. I said, I don't. I'll work other jobs. Whatever it takes, I'll work for free for one year. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay. And I ended up interning there for a year and probably learned more in one year than you learn in three years of law school. <laughs> um, 
There was only one law school that I wanted to apply to, Golden Gate, at the time had the great criminal defense clinical program. Right. And the letter came and I was rejected. This is almost a year into my internship. And I was thoroughly depressed and the lawyers that morning walked in and found out why I was depressed and asked me the name of the dean of the law school and said, well, so sorry, listen, we've got a busy day at court, we'll be back at five o'clock, don't leave, we have work for you. So I said, okay. End of day, they show up. Turns out they'd all gone home, canceled their court dates, put on their best suits, went down to the law school, met the dean, cornered her in her office and said, we are Bayview Hunters Point. They were renowned, uh, an impeccable reputation. And they said, do we have good credibility with Golden Gate University School of Law? And she said, yes. And they said, in that case, do you have a wild card admission? And she said, yes. <laughs> and they said, great, write the name Gary Goldstein down. We want him in this law school. You won't regret it. She said, okay. Five o'clock, they come back to Bayview Hunters Point. They call me into our ramshackle conference room. They're standing three guys in beautiful suits on top of a funky wooden table, each holding a bottle of champagne, saying, <laughs> congratulations, counselor. And they explained what had just happened. And I literally broke out in tears. That, that we, we had come to such a level of, of respect for each other and friendship and you know, it's. It, I mean, I've seen it now a thousand times since mm -hmm. the the importance of building relationship, exalting relationship over everything in life, and building your social equity, and just being a good person. Oh, I know, and I know you live that. So, if it weren't for those guys, I don't know where I would have, what direction I might have gone, but I certainly wouldn't have made it into law school. Not at that time. Right. And. Uh, Oh, so here's the capper. The punchline is, uh, I worked feverishly. I was terrified not to excel. Exactly. Right now, I had a, like I had a price on my head. <laughs> so I worked hard, and I won a. It was a silly scholarship. It was called the Law Wives Scholarship. What did that mean? I don't know. <laughs> but I won it. Okay. That's what's important. I'm glad I didn't ask you. <laughs> and I remember for the law school newspaper, they took a photo of me with the dean and the head of the law wives organization or whatever it was. And it was on the front page of the newspaper. And in the, in the photo, it, 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 it had an article about it. But in the photo, I'm turning sideways talking to the dean, Judy mm -hmm. McKelvey, and saying, did I, did I do well? Did I, did I do good for Baby Hunter's Point? And she's smiling. So I explained why I'm not facing the camera to the guys. And it was a big, it's a big life lesson, you know. I mean, it, it, that was, uh, I, I didn't practice law for long. It wasn't really my temperament. It was not nearly the romantic thing I'd imagine. Yeah. It's a tough, harsh, uh, really brutal. There's some great lessons to learn here. I mean, remember Les Brown's story about how he became a DJ? I just hang, he would not leave the he would not leave the it studio would, essentially. Yeah. And, and this is this is your story. You just you know persist, consistent, persistent. I'm um, I'm here. I'm gonna work here. That's all there is to it. Uh, I mean that's a great lesson. And then once you get what you want, then you need to follow through. Yeah. <laughs> you know it's not mental activity. It's physical activity. It's like get in the game. Yeah. Be good. Put your all put your shoulder into it. Right. Care about it. And, and, and just be yourself, just, you know, I mean, bring your personality to it, bring your humor to it, just be whoever you are, let people engage with you and have fun.